Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar, which has been convened by the International Menopause Society. It's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you today. Um, and I would just like to acknowledge the support of Pfizer, who have provided us with funding in order to make this webinar possible today. My name is Rod Baber, and I will be chairing this webinar today, as well as speaking to you for a short time as well. Many of you might know me, but I'm a professor of OBS and Gynae at the University of Sydney in Australia. So I'm down under in the middle of the night. Um, I'm also a past president of both the International and Australasian Menopause Societies as well. My disclosures are that I've received uh, funding for lectures given at pharma sponsored sessions in the past, and I've conducted research at the University of Sydney for a number of different products. And that funding has been provided by different companies over the years. None of it has ended up in my pocket. This webinar is sponsored by Pfizer. And as I said, uh, uh, convened by the IMS, but neither of those bodies have had any role in the selection of topics or speakers, nor have they vetted or interfered with any of the presentations which you're going to see tonight. And although this webinar will talk about some products, it's important for you to realize that this is an international webinar and some of the things we say may not necessarily be approved for the products we're talking about in your country. Our agenda tonight comprises three uh, lectures followed by questions and answers. We'll start with a title of 2020 Vision, Clarity for a New Decade of Menopause Care, followed by a fresh perspective on a familiar challenge, relatable risk communication, and then shared decision-making in benefit risk conversations. To help me with that tonight, I have great pleasure in welcoming Dr. Merrin McKinnon from Melbourne in Australia and Professor Rossella Napi from Italy. We look forward to talking to you and hopefully to answering all the questions that you have. Our objectives really are to help you to cut through what I might call research noise, the sort of things that you become overwhelmed by at times because there is so much stuff out there and you don't know what to believe and what not to believe. We'd like to teach you how better to understand benefit risk communication, to learn how best to prevent, present that information to your patients, and particularly to apply that knowledge to some of the patients that we have who we might regard as challenging patient types. So let's start with 2020 vision, the clarity for a new decade of menopause care. But of course, before we can move forward, we really have to go back and have a little bit of a look at the past. And if we look at the last decade, the 2010s, I think one of the things that was quite reassuring when we started that decade was confirmation that transdermal estrogen did not increase thromboembolic risk. We'd known for some time, principally from Women's Health Initiative data, that oral estrogen, either alone or in combination with a progestogen, did slightly increase the risk of thromboembolic disease. But by 2011, we'd had quite a lot of convincing evidence to show us that transdermal therapy did not. About that same time, we had a lot of discussion, um, including information in product packs, which said you must only use the lowest dose of hormone therapy and you must use it for the shortest possible time. But Early in the last decade, we had advice from professional societies around the world, all saying the same thing, which was obviously you should use the lowest effective dose of menopausal hormone therapy, but also that there should be no mandatory stopping time. The treatment should be consistent with your treatment goal and you should maintain it accordingly. In 2013, we saw the release of a completely new form of MHT. DUA-V, as it was called, was approved by the FDA for use in the United States. 
and it was comprised of conjugated estrogen plus a selective estrogen receptor modulator, vasodoxyphene. The same product was approved in Europe by the EMA in 2014. And of course, back in 2013, we also had the first publication from the Women's Health Initiative team looking at longitudinal outcomes for women in the WHI trials. It provided us very useful insights into what longitudinal use of hormone therapy meant for all of those women who participated in those trials. In 2015, we had observational data from Finland, which showed us that cardiovascular mortality actually increased if you stopped menopausal hormone therapy. And that's entirely consistent with all the basic science we know and the effects that estrogen has on lipids, on nitric oxide production, and on the progression of atheroma. In 2016 and the years surrounding it, we had a range of extensive comprehensive guidelines on the use of menopausal hormone therapy and the management of midlife women's health. In 2016, it was the IMS guideline. In 2015, the US Endocrine Society. Um, and then later, the NICE guideline from the UK. And of course, the NAMS uh, position statement as well. All of those important documents were consistent in their message. And at the same time, all of those societies and others joined forces to publish a global consensus statement on the use of MHT in midlife women. A terribly important document. It really set the stage and should have helped us enormously in going forward with a clear vision of what was to happen for women. That was helped further in 2017 when the WHI team published their long-term mortality data, which showed us that for women who were initiated on hormone therapy in their 50s, between age 50 and 59, there was actually a protective effect against all-cause mortality. So really the 2010s were pretty good up to that point. But as is always the case in medicine, it seems, we ended the decade on a bit of a downer when a paper was published which suggested that the link between menopausal hormones and therapy and breast cancer was actually larger than we had previously thought. So where does this lead us for the next decade? That was the past decade we spoke about. So what's going to happen between now and 2030? When one of your patients comes to your office and she arrives in a car that's completely automated and she doesn't have to steer it or turn it on or turn it off or put on the brake and probably has other things that are novel and different as well, are we going to use the same sort of approach to a medical consultation as we did before or even last century? Or are we going to try and take a step forward and improve our means of communication? I believe that's one of our challenges for the future. But one of our other challenges also has to be looking after the overall health of women. And I would just like to make a plug here to remind you that our role as clinicians is to look after the overall of health of women going through midlife and beyond. And that includes working together so that we can ensure that every woman everywhere in the world can be safe in her home, can be free from the risk of physical, psychological or socioeconomic abuse, and that she has access to at least basic health care. We must all remember that that's our single most important goal. And then we come to the issue of cutting through the noise, what I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. When it comes to problems that women experience during midlife and beyond, if we're going to maximize each woman's overall health moving forward, we need to be able to have a clear, straightforward discussion with her about the appropriate use of MHT based on the available evidence. And the best way to do that is to cut through the noise that we're all surrounded by 
and try to focus on clinical studies that are relevant, that have good evidence to support the claims that they're making, and that also acknowledge any limitations that they might have. A good example of that is this paper here, the use of hormone therapy in the risk of thromboembolism. This paper was published in 2019. It's a nested case control study. 80,000 women were analyzed, mostly from UK primary care sources. And because of the volume of patients in this study, the authors were able not only to confirm that transdermal preparations of MHT do not influence VTE or thromboembolic risk, but also they were able to show us differences between individual preparations as well. Of course, they showed us that oral MHT did slightly increase VTE risk, but again, in absolute terms, the difference was only small. What would you criticize about this study? Well, it's observational. And any observational study that we do is always subject to the possibility of what are called confounders, things that we can't completely exclude because of the nature of the study itself, things that we hope to exclude by doing proper randomized trials. And then on the other side of the coin, there was this paper, the one I mentioned a moment ago, which was published in 2019 and attracted enormous attention. It did that for several reasons. The title of the paper is attractive, the type and timing of menopausal hormone therapy and breast cancer risk, individual participant meta-analysis of the worldwide data. That drew the attention to the media. And if they hadn't noticed, the journal in which it was published made sure there was a press release. It caused quite a lot of noise. It was a meta-analysis of nearly 570,000 postmenopausal women from 58 studies. And the author's conclusions were really quite alarming. They claimed that five years of daily use of estrogen plus progestogen MHT begun at the age of 50 increased the risk of breast cancer by one more per 50 women, one in 50. And also that MHT had already caused a million of 20 million breast cancer cases since 1990. Well, of course, it was observational. Most of the data was actually quite old. In fact, this is a very interesting historical paper because very much of this data reports to studies done before even the Women's Health Initiative. Only observational epidemiological data was used and there was no randomized clinical trial data included whatsoever. So this is a study which caused a lot of noise and a lot of alarm and probably more than it should have. Remember what I said before, that observational studies always have confounders. And because of that, they can tend to overestimate either benefit or risk. And you can see here in this slide, that was very clearly the case. If you look at either the estrogen only arm or the estrogen plus progestogen arm, the data we see from the Lancet paper shows much higher risk than the results that were reported in the Women's Health Initiative. Now, the WHI data is largely more recent than the Lancet data, and it comes from a randomized clinical trial where those confounders are eliminated. So it's more likely that the data we have from the RCT is closer to the truth than the data we are seeing from observational studies. There was a quick response, and this is another illustration of what we have to be able to do moving forward into the 2020s and the 2030s. A group of societies led by IMS, the BMS, the AMS, EMAS, and the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists quickly issued a response to these claims. It was delivered to the media, it was delivered to government authority and it was released to members of the public and of our profession. And it said three simple things. 
any recommendation on the risk of breast cancer with MHT should consider all the collective data, including data on newer regimens using different progestogens or indeed even products which have no progestogen, such as a T-sec. Secondly, the dose and duration of therapy should be consistent with your treatment goal and not restricted by any arbitrary limit. And finally, that the decision to use MHT should be taken by each woman after evaluating the overall benefits and risks which she has, including symptom management and improved quality of life and cardiovascular and bone protective effects. It should not be based on a single component of a very complex equation. But part of our problem is conveying that information to our patients. And one of the things that the Lancet paper failed to do was that it actually failed to show that there was much of a difference in terms of loss of life associated with the use of MHT. And one of the more reassuring things you can say to your patients is that we have very convincing data from the Women's Health Initiative suggesting that there is no increased risk of death from cancer or indeed any other cause for women who use MHT compared to women who used placebo only. And further support for that argument came only a few months ago with the release of the latest paper from the WHI team published in July of last year, looking at the association of MHT with both breast cancer incidence and mortality. So this is 20 year follow up. And you can see from the chart, the graph on the right, the Kaplan-Meier curve, that for women who used conjugated estrogens and MPA, there was, as we had known before, a small increase in the risk of breast cancer. But again, there was no increase in mortality for users of combined therapy compared to placebo. For the women who used only estrogen, there was a reduction in the risk of breast cancer compared to the women who used placebo, and there was a reduction in the risk of breast cancer mortality compared to the women who used placebo. So we've come a long way from 2002 when the authors of the original WHI paper said, if you take hormones, you're going to not only get breast cancer, but to a situation in 2020, when the same authors are saying, estrogen only may reduce your risk of death from breast cancer. One of our tasks moving forward, of course, is not only to evaluate the data as we have already, and as we will see in the future, but also to look at new innovations in the form of hormone therapy and non-hormonal therapy, which might benefit our patients. And one of those, of course, is the TSEC, known as Duaviv in Europe and Australia, and Duaviv in the United States. A TSEC is a tissue selective estrogen complex, the partnering of a selective estrogen receptor modulator with an estrogen. In this case, the estrogen is conjugated estrogens and the selective estrogen receptor modulator is basidoxephine, which has an anti-estrogenic effect in the endometrium. And the trick here is that the combination of the two products is different to what each product would do on its own. If we look at it here in this slide, you can see on the left that conjugated estrogens are very beneficial in alleviating vasomotor symptoms, um, vulvovaginal atrophy, and cardiovascular and bone problems. But they do stimulate the endometrium and they can cause endometrial hyperplasia. Basidoxephine, on the other hand, doesn't alleviate vasomotor symptoms. But if you put the two together, you get net overall benefit, relief of vasomotor symptoms, minimal stimulation of the breast, no effect on the endometrium, alleviation of, of vulvovaginal atrophy or GSM and protection of the skeleton. So how do we fulfill our 2020s vision moving forward? Well, first I think 
we need to continue to develop our understanding of the important role that menopausal hormone therapy plays in managing the health of women in midlife. We learned a lot in the 2010s, but we have a great deal more to do in the 2020s. Globally, two major causes of death are cardiovascular disease and cognitive disease. And unattended, both of those will be a huge burden on public health purses all around the world in the next decade and beyond. So let's commit ourselves to learning more and more about the prevention of these diseases and other diseases of aging so that we can improve the health and longevity of our population. We also need to think of better leverage therapies with ha which have a more favorable safety profile. Things like the TSEC and also novel non-hormonal molecules such as neurokinin B receptor blockers, which might be useful for alleviating vasomotor symptoms for women who cannot take hormones in the future, such as, for example, women who have survived breast cancer. And of course, there is a gap between healthcare provider knowledge and women's knowledge. And we need to address this gap seriously. We need to understand what women really fear about hormones. Why are they reluctant to use MHT? Is it because they fear the risks of MHT, which are so frequently misrepresented in the media? Is it because they want more information before they make a decision? Is it because they don't like us telling them what to do? Is it because they think MHT is part of a conspiracy between doctors and pharma companies? Is it because they don't really understand the benefits of MHT? Particularly when we would choose to prescribe them only for the right reasons and for the right women? Or is it that we can't possibly and probably explain that? Or is it simply that they think their doctors aren't listening? For reasons that I don't understand, many women will choose to use alternative therapies that are mostly lacking in evidence of benefit and are usually more expensive than MHT. Maybe it's because those women are duped by glitzy advertising and smooth talkers, but I suspect that's not the case. I think it might be because the traditional doctor-patient relationship is changing and that we have to move with the times or we'll be left behind. We have to revisit that relationship and do more to regain the trust and confidence of our patients. We need to achieve a better understanding of ways to support women. We need to devise better ways to communicate with our patients in a reliable, trustworthy manner. We need to cut through the research noise and rely on relevant clinical studies of MHT, which are indeed based on solid evidence. And we need to feel empowered to have constructive benefit risk conversations about MHT with women in order to achieve the support that they are seeking from us. So I hope you've found that an interesting introduction. And it's my pleasure now to hand over to Dr. Merrin McKinnon, who will continue the conversation. Thank you very much, Professor Baber. And uh, it's my absolute pleasure to be here with you all today. So <laughs> what I would like to talk to you about the today is a little bit more about how we navigate that gap that Professor Baber was describing. And to begin, I'll start by telling you a little bit of a story. So I have a 12 year old daughter and she and her friends are all entering puberty. Um, it's a time of excitement, a little bit of fear and trepidation, um, but there's a real shared bond and they're talking about it and they're sharing stories and experiences and information and some of it's even factual. And it's an exciting new phase of life for them. Contrast this with one of my colleagues who was experiencing some premenopausal symptoms and when she went to speak to her GP was blithely told, oh, it's all right, it's just the beginning of the end. Doesn't really have that same level of excitement and in, you know, wonder and joy attached to it. So menopause really has a little bit of an image problem. 
Now, I, I saw in the questions already that um, some of you have already experienced some of this in your own countries where menopause really isn't spoken about. It's not publicly celebrated or acknowledged in the same way as pregnancy or puberty might be. In some cases, it's almost something of a taboo. It's, it's something of, you talk about it obliquely, a women of a certain age. But once you have that taboo, you sort of have this shroud of of mystery around it as well and with that taboo and that secrecy comes the potential for a lot of misinformation and misapprehension about options. So my role here today is to talk to you about menopause and your interactions with patients from the perspective of science communication. Now science communicators work everywhere from schools and museums to government and not-for-profits and we deal with sciences that are readily accepted and hotly contested. So before we go too much further, why should you listen to me? I'm not a medical doctor. The only thing I could possibly fix for you is the quality of your argument and your referencing. But I am trained as a scientist. I know how science works. And I went, went into science communication when I realized that a lot of the changes that I wanted to make um, in conservation or in policy outcomes could actually be done, be done more effectively through effective communication with people than the research I was currently doing, doing moving into tidal snails with paint scrapers. I've worked as a science communicator and I have journalism qualifications as well. And everything I'm talking to you about today, I use as a practitioner of science communication as well as an academic. So everything is tried and true. Now you'd think after all of that training and all of that experience, I'd have some really profound, deep information for you, something very complicated. But sadly, it's really, really quite simple. The most effective way to communicate in contested spaces or with patients or even family and friends generally is to break it down into two simple rules. Know your audience and know your goal. So who are you speaking to? What do you actually know about them? And what do you want them to think, feel, say or do as a result of that communication? If you can get as much information and understanding of both of those things before you start your communication, then you're really setting yourself up for communication success in everywhere where you might be communicating. So what does this mean in practice? There's often a lot of talk of oh, if people only knew the facts that I did, if people only had the information, then they'd understand and then they'd do what's the right, what the right thing is. But giving people more information and more and more information simply doesn't work. Now, if we were all in a room together as originally planned, thank you 2020, then I would be asking you now to raise your hand if you or someone you know still smokes tobacco products. And I would probably guess that quite a few of you would have hands up. And I'd ask you to keep your hand up if you found uh, that there had never been any kind of information at all given in your country that smoking was bad for your health. And then you'd see that the majority, I go out in the limb and say all hands would go down. We know that smoking is bad for health. That is well established. It's not argued anymore, but people still do it. So it's not necessarily the lack of information that's driving this behavior. It's something else. So where do we start with this? What could this something else be? To explore this a little bit further, I'll draw on a study I did with a colleague looking at vaccination communication from two very distinct time periods. So one is from the early 19th century when uh, Europeans invaded and settled in, in Australia and the early 21st century. So both both time periods were very much looking at the government's means of communicating with people, trying to get them to vaccinate themselves and their children against disease. So we analysed it using Aristotle's modes of persuasion as part of our analysis. And so there we have logos, so the facts, the information, the ethos, which is your experience, your expertise, almost you know, the trust me, I'm a doctor section, and pathos, the emotional appeals. So you can see that the facts did make up a big part of it, but the expertise of the, of the messenger, as well as the emotional appeals, 
were also quite prevalent. And if you look at the nature of those emotional appeals, and you can see some excerpts there from, from the communication of the time, it is incredibly um, heartfelt and pointed and very much drawing upon, well, you know, parents, you have a responsibility. If we compare this to the modern day, you can see that facts are there probably in greater weight than they were before and certainly at the expense of expertise, but definitely at the expense of pathos. So the emotional appeals have been significantly reduced. Now, what we are finding is that some states and territories are starting to bring back these emotional appeals because Australia, like many countries are, are experiencing an increase in vaccine hesitancy. And so we're starting to bring these emotional appeals back in to try and connect with audiences a little bit more. But in order to connect with our audiences on an emotional level, we also need to understand their emotions as well. When we're asking people to do something, we're asking them to evaluate if it's the right choice for them. And people interpret risk differently. So for many of us, well, all of us, every single day, we are making decisions about risk, which can often be pretty much unconscious. So where we buy food, uh, what mode of transport we take, where we go, these are all calculations of risk and the decisions that we make, the trust is implicit. But for your patients, when you're talking to them and giving them information about something which is incredibly personal and possibly also confronting, you may be a trusted source of information, but the evaluation of risk is going to be that much more considered. So how do people evaluate risk? There are three fundamental ways that you can do this. The first is risk as feelings. And this is literally that gut feel. Mm, I don't like how, no, this doesn't feel right to me. I'm not going to do it. The second one is analysis and workplaces have this down to a fine art. This is where you go through everything, all of the things that could possibly go wrong, every single eventuality and you map it out. The final one, is final one is politics, and this should be very familiar after 2020. So risk uh, characterized as politics generally occurs when the feelings of risk and the analysis of risk clash. Now your patients or people generally can be experiencing and characterizing risk one of these ways or more than one of these ways and often simultaneously. So you have to start to think about how they're evaluating this risk, what kind of arguments they're bringing to it, and then you can work from there. The other way that you can talk about risk or think about risk is in an equation. So risk is equal to the hazard, the thing that could possibly go wrong, and outrage. The outrage is the emotional response that occurs if the thing goes wrong. When we mentioned before, we have this technical understanding of risk and we map out every possible eventuality where things could go wrong. We also need to put that same lens and that same focus over the different emotional responses that people might have and use that to start to plan out the communication. It's also important to remember that sometimes the resistance or the outrage may not have anything to do with the hazard itself. So I mentioned before that we're having an increase in vaccine hesitancy in Australia, but Australia also has a compulsory vaccination schedule where student or children who aren't fully vaccinated may be excluded from some childcare centres, for example, or parents may be punished financially, so they won't receive a certain benefit if their child is not fully immunised. A lot of the outrage from this scenario isn't about the vaccination per se, it's about the fact that the government is taking away the parents' right to decide what is best for their child. So sometimes the resistance that you may experience may not be about the actual hazard, the actual thing, it could be something else. So how do you, how do you identify this? How do you deal with this? You already have the fundamentals. as people working in healthcare, empathy is core to what you do and empathy is core to all effective communication. So I mentioned before that we're starting to see that return to emotional appeals. And we're seeing this in, again, the vaccination campaigns with mothers talking about horrendous situations where they have lost a, a child who was too young to be immunized because others around them hadn't immunized, they were exposed. Somebody else made that risky decision for them. 
we're hardwired to engage with stories, to exchange information that way. And there is an emotional reaction and a response to stories. So the, the interest, the wonder, the excitement, I'm not gonna lie. It's going to be pretty hard to tell a story that elicits intrigue, wonder and excitement about menopause. But what you can do is listen deeply to your patient and identify some common ground, some things that you might have in common or some shared areas where you might be able to at least keep the door to conversations going. So you need to actually start to think about not necessarily what they're, what they're saying they're, they're angry about or reacting to, but what lies underneath. So you can do this by listening deeply. If someone is responding to something negatively and some free relationship advice for you here as well, listen to what's actually driving that anger. Is it fear? Is it frustration at the impacts of um, their condition on their career, their family life? Is it the fact that they're experiencing changes which emotionally they're not equipped to deal with just yet? So what is actually driving that resistance? It is difficult to do this in the time that you have allotted, but if you are listening deeply, and quite often we forget the communication is a two-way process. We spend a lot of time thinking about what am I going to say? How should I write this? But quite often if you, if you are listening, what the person is saying will help you uncover what the actual resistance is, what values are lying underneath. And once you find those values, then that gives you that common ground to keep the conversation going. You may not get to the point where they are in agreement when doing with what you want them to do. But if they feel like they have been listened to, then you are keeping that door open for conversation and incrementally you can help them move along to your desired goal, which is a positive patient outcome. So the way that we can do this is listen to your patient and reevaluate your response based on how they're responding to the hazard. How are they interpreting the risk? Is it based on factual information or something else? And where is the outrage? What values are driving that emotional response? How else can you start to work with them, identify that common ground? Now, think about who you are to them. Yes, you are their doctor, but you, you could be more as well. You might uh, have been living, uh, living in the same community for many years. You have that shared community cultural value. You might be avid rock climbers. You might both be grandparents or belong to the same social club. Look for other platforms and areas of common ground that you can use to keep or move the conversation to a safe shared space and build from there. It's about building and maintaining that trust. So overall, choices about risk involve much more than just information. We're messy, complex, convoluted beings, and often we don't do the sensible thing. So facts alone aren't enough to convince us. And we may not also be able to receive the information that we need to. Our values, our emotions might get in the way. Now, an emotional response and personal values do play a big role. And this is true now more than ever, as Professor Nappi's talk will, will touch upon. This is why it's very important to know your audience. Who are you talking to? Listen deeply to them. And eventually, by knowing your audience, your communication can adapt to suit their needs and you can meet them where they are. And ultimately, you have a relationship that's built on respect, and you can ultimately reach your goal, which benefits both you and your patients. Thank you very much. It is now my great pleasure to hand over to Professor Rosella Nappi to talk to you next. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, it's my real pleasure to uh, share with you the screen uh, today and uh, go on uh, with this uh, wonderful uh, uh, conversation we are having on the topic. Uh, and my goal uh, today is really to uh, offer you my personal view on how you should present the risk benefit information to your patient in order to make informed decision on menopause hormone therapy. 
Uh, yeah, uh, who I am, I'm full professor OBGYN at the University of Pavia, Italy. And uh, I'm currently, I have the pleasure and honor to be the general secretary elected of the International Menopause Society. Let's start by saying that health communication is a real challenge. We have uh, listened to our speakers before. We have number out there. We have uh, the way we perceive the information that we offer to people depending on our uh, background uh, in terms of emotional aspects, cognition, etc. But when we deal with uh, uh, health decision making, we really have uh, so many information uh, to deal with. And especially in menopause, we have to make choices. And uh, both for doctors and for women, choices uh, are not a black and white, uh, yes or no choices. But sometimes uh, it's a different shades of gray. And with menopause, we deal with a stigmatized topic. Uh, Dr. McKinnon said that very well. Women, they don't feel comfortable sometimes when they sit in the office with the doctor to discuss about menopause. And also, even doctors, sometimes they use words that are too difficult to be understood by patient. We have heard by Rod all these numbers, all this information. So for people, it's very difficult to do a risk and benefit evaluation in the 20 minutes or 15 minutes we have in the doctor visit. And we have a specific challenge as, uh, with menopause. You know, I, I, I just want to tell you a little story. We have heard that in the past, uh, when I was young, when we start uh, the, uh, dealing with the menopause medicine, in my opinion, the process in the office was much easier. Why was that? Because women, they were coming to our office, they knew that menopause was a natural phenomenon, but they perceived that this condition was giving them some symptoms and problem that was a turning point in the aging process. And so they came to see us because they wanna be treated in some way. They wanna get rid of the symptoms and they, at the meantime, they wanna uh, prevent uh, condition. And also doctors, they were feeling that menopause should be treated like any other medical condition, especially if symptoms were present. So they were their own solid information out there that you take and collect uh, some history, symptoms and risk factors for your patient. Then you communicate risk and benefits and you take an individualized decision. So for women, that was easy. And I remember my patient the, the year after saying, wow, my bone mineral density is back to normal. I feel better, this is good. Not so many complaints, not so many side effects. But now these are all new, new, uh, new information and all the story that Rod told us has changed completely the picture. We have a lot of conflicting information out there. Even doctors, they don't feel so much comfortable uh, in sharing risk and benefits. So women, they have a lot of misconception and taboo, and they believe that menopause is natural. So they say, why we should treat this condition? And so this is a difficult job in our daily practice. And this is the reason why I want to share with you the case of uh, one of my cases, uh, that is Mrs. K. Mrs. K came to see us to, in my office. Of course, I, um, I collect some information. And to be a good doctor and to try to focus in just a few minutes on the most relevant symptoms and on the different risk factors that this woman can have is not a difficult task. 
I can discover that my patient is postmenopausal, that she has some kind of symptoms, mild to moderate hot flashes. She complains on many other aspects, especially she has some kind of risk factors such as hypertension, um, a, a, a dense breast, and she had always some kind of bad experience by using progestogen. So I focus in a two or three minutes on what is relevant from a medical point of view. But my challenge is really to understand not only this other fact, but also the perspective of the woman in terms of what she thinks is relevant to her at the time of menopause. And you see that in the real world of my patient K, what she focuses her attention? First of all, that she has gained some weight and she doesn't think about that being overweight is giving you some cardiovascular risk. She just focuses on the weight because she want to keep her feminine. For example, she is distressed by entering this period of her life because she feels young and she does not believe that she is entering menopause because this is the image as dr mckinnon she wanna keep of herself and so she doesn't like to feel old but also we know nowadays that women they want to keep natural and they are so afraid about estrogen so they are afraid that this estrogen can give cancer so i really need to listen to my patient to understand in a real world which one are the key aspects i should discuss with her i cannot just say okay i give you this hormone because it will protect you from cardiovascular risk this will not work so what we do in real practice I give you some suggestion from my personal experience. Let's start with something that the woman care. It cannot be menopause, I'm still so young. So we really need to explain to women that it's true they are still so young. Why it is the case, it, this is the case? Because we know that we have an increased longevity nowadays, that the average woman will live more or less one third of her life following menopause. And this is the reason why the topic is so important to discuss. And also that it's true that menopause is natural, but more or less 100 years ago, women, they were not entering menopause really because the end of the lifespan or mother nature uh, decided it was good to stop the bleeding was good to enter menopause, yes, because we were not living longer. So this is something that make women reflect on this point, and this is useful. So I'm young, but I have still a long segment of my life to live uh, with without uh, the uh, biological protection of my hormones. This is very important point. Another aspect that we should discuss and we should not dismiss, because this is a big mistake, dismissing concern of the patient, deny that there is a problem. Women, they fear breast cancer. So we should really give women a new perspective. You should look at this, it's true, because we know that breast cancer risk is there for every woman when she entered the menopause and we should give the number in a different perspective what i want to say by that we really need to acknowledge that 45 women out of 1000 for example between the age of 50 and 70 can have this problem but there are many factors they can affect that risk apart age and being a woman and we should put these factors, they are so common, into perspective. So if we list, for example, uh, this information and we say to women that if you are overweight, you increase by a significant number of cases, your risk. If you drink alcohol, if you do not exercise, then women they will say, wow. So at the very end, to take five years of hormones, 
I gain, uh, I achieve only two extra cases of breast cancer instead of achieving more uh, increase in body weight. So you will help the patient to put the risk into perspective and you will also teach to women something. And maybe women that will not be on hormones, but at least they will think about that it's a good thing to exercise or not drink too much or lose some body weight. So you will achieve something anyway. Another way of discussing, uh, it's really to make a clear and visual example. You have, uh, you remember that my patient Kay, uh, she was afraid of osteoporosis. She wanna be checked. And so this is something she's a sensitive. So it's nice to uh, select, for example, a cartoon to explain and to uh, visualize what is happening to her bone when she enters menopause, because this is something she care about. And so you can uh, share this simple image, uh, you can find it easily, uh, in which you, uh, that help you to discuss the osteoporosis risk. And so you will show the image at the beginning of menopause, here is your bone, and uh, following a couple of years, uh, in the meantime, you repeat your bone scan, you can find that your bone is full of hollows and it's fragile, whereas, Estrogen, you see here, it's very important to protect your bone in terms not only of, uh, uh, of structure, but also in terms of fitness. And women, they will understand very, very easily. Another very important point is to put the number that Rod uh, sh uh, shared with us in the right perspective. We really need to focus not on the number by itself, but on the relevance in terms of absolute number, absolute risk. And also in order to put the risk and benefits into perspective, we really need to focus the attention on hard facts, such as, for example, increased breast cancer risk or improvement of hip, hip fracture, and also on the other very important benefits for women, that is on quality of life, because when we enter uh, menopause, the majority of women, you see there is a crowd here of women, they can gain improvement in hot flashes. And this is a big number out of 1,000. And the increased breast cancer risk is little, and also improvement of hip, hip fracture is little, but it's highly significant for on the long term. And it's also very important to explain to women that when you have hot flashes, and in particular, when you have moderate to severe hot flashes, to take care of your hot flashes is not only a way to improve your quality of life and well-being, but it's also important to understand that hot flashes are a red flag, meaning that your body is much more sensitive to estrogen deficiency. And so if you do something to relieve hot flashes, you will do something good also for your cardiovascular risk and for your osteoporosis prevention. And so you put these two aspects and with numbers and with the different uh, colors, you can show a red or a green uh, perspective to your, to your patient, and she will understand better. Another example is how you may explain a new compound that it's something, you know, really strange to your patient, such as, for example, the T-sec. And uh, it's nice to explain this with very simple word, we know that traditional menopause hormone therapy is there. We know that estrogen are doing some good to uh, the women's body because they protect women health in general. They relieve from hot flashes. They help maintaining the bone. We know, however, that when we add the progestin, we can do some good because we protect the uterus, but we know that we may have some side effects 
in general, let's say headache or bloating, women, they experience that. And also my patient, Kay, she experienced that kind of symptoms in the past. But we know from the data that when you add a progestogen, of course, you protect the endometrium from endometrial cancer, but unfortunately, you increase the density of the breast and you uh, have some data out there that suggest that by adding the progestogen, you may increase breast cancer risk associated with the use of, of menopause hormone therapy. When you explain TSEC, you really need to explain to women that this is a new concept in which you combine conjugated estrogen with a specific uh, molecule that is a, a selective estrogen receptor modulator. So in this way, you do not need to add a progestogen to protect the uterus. So you may achieve the benefits that derive from the use of estrogen alone. You add some benefit in terms not only of endometrial protection because you don't need the progestogen, but you can counteract the uh, endometrial stimulation, but you may add some benefit to the to the bone because the sum basidoxifen is capable to promote together with estrogen bone health. We don't have a so long-term data to suggest that you may some way protect the breast or do not increase the breast cancer risk. But thinking about the biochemical nature of the sum, in my opinion, this is my real personal opinion, you can make some example to your patient and saying that drugs from the same class uh, such as SERM are used in even in breast cancer patients. So you may reassure that this molecule, they are friend, good friend of the breast usually, and we will see for the future what will happen. But at least you propose a treatment that try to solve some of the problem we have with uh, menopause hormone therapy. Of course, this is a treatment that does not fit all women. Maybe not some women, they will not gain no benefits, but at least you present all the different information that you can give to the patient. So I try to do some example in order to help you to gain techniques for a successful conversation. It's always very important in order to go to the end of my talk to try to use a very simple word. For example, if you want to express that a treatment is effective, maybe it's better you say, you know, this treatment works well in women like yourself. If you want to explain some risk, maybe you can say there is the chance is possible that you may experience some side effects, something can happen, good or bad. You really need to adapt the language, try to keep plain and simple. Also very important is to try to identify, as I told you, which is the main concern of the woman, to try to explain something and to understand if the patient was able to get your message. So you do a sort of recap with your patient, you summarize the good point, the bad point, and you try to have an action. This is the real therapeutic alliance you can establish with your patient to try to understand the concern. Uh, and then you really try to explain why that treatment is beneficial for her and then if the woman, she's still afraid, maybe you can try to reassure her that you will treat her anyway, even though if she will not follow your suggestion. The most important uh, thing is to reassure the woman that you will be always there. And maybe some, uh, we still have some uncertainty. Uh, we cannot really say, what will happen for the future, but you will go on studying and looking at her in order to understand what is better to her. So you never give up to follow your patient. In summary, uh, uh, I think 
that it's very true that patients want information and they want this information by doctors, so by ourselves. It's very important to ask a question to uncover the patient preconception. And there are many preconceptions out there, unfortunately. We really need to identify the issue that you, you, it's the more important to be able to uh, have the balance between the benefit and risk with your patient. And in order to personalize this benefit and risk conversation, to support the treatment decision-making process. And very important, don't forget the language. It's true that we are doctor, it's true that we are professor, but in that particular setting, we are really side by side with our patient. And patient, they wanna feel that we understand them in some way. And I would like to end my talk discussing with you this very important principle by Hippocrates. Primum non nocere, first do not harm. Think about what is happening at menopause. I'm in the menopause field because I really believe that as a doctor, as a woman doctor, and now also I'm a postmenopausal woman, we have a unique opportunity to practice real preventive medicine. And if we avoid the discussion with our patient, we fail our role as clinician. It is much easier to say, listen, there is nothing to do about this, just aging. It's a natural period in your life. No commitment, my dear friend, no responsibility, no potential harm. But please keep in mind that it's so much a pleasure in helping people to live well and healthy and we can do harm. Even when we remain passive and silent, we miss a tremendous opportunity for making a difference in the life of our patient. And I believe that doctors are there really for doing some good to patients in general and to our dear postmenopausal and perimenopausal women. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. And please, we are now ready with Rob to take your question. Thanks very much, Rosella. Wonderful talk. Thank you, Marin. Also a wonderful talk. Marin, I see a, quite a lot of questions have come asking for information about where they can get the stuff you've been talking about. Could you speak to that at all? Uh, yes, so I did share the some of the papers that um, I I used or drew upon um, for this uh, for this presentation. Um, I'm not sure if the slides will be made available or not, but I'm very happy for people to email me after this as well with specific <laughs> questions or resources that they might like. So search for me. I'm at the Australian National University. Marin's not a very common name, so I should pop up pretty easily. But um, there's lots of questions on here, and I, I think it really speaks to to what both uh, both you, Rod, and you, Rosella, have been talking about, and that's in terms of you know how do doctors? There's there's one particular question: How do you get doctors to listen to feedback and manage patient expectations? So, say you're prescribing one thing, how can you justify that choice or that recommendation to a patient? And when it doesn't work how can you get doctors to, to listen to the patient and help them try something else? You know, the most important uh, issue here, it's really to uh, give the patient the impression that you uh, are doing the risk balance uh, perspective. And when you select a treatment, you try to select the best for her, first of all, in terms of uh, health risk, this is for sure, but also what is in line with her uh, preference. But of course, if the woman, she is afraid of taking a hormones, we cannot endorse uh, really that it is good to be natural or to take some treatment that is not evidence-based. Mm -hmm. We can always say to the woman, okay, try, but please be back in three months. 
And also what we have uh, to think about that is not only drugs that we have to prescribe at menopause. This is a very important point. The first line treatment to remember is to care about diet, lifestyle, the way she exercises, the mood, uh, the way she connects with the other women, for example, uh, discussing the menopause as well. So to try to uh, raise a friendly environment in which women, they understand that, of course, if you have extremely severe hot flashes, keep in mind, you will not discuss too much about the risk and benefits. You want to get rid about that. But when you have mild symptom, maybe you should give some time to the woman to adjust. And so you just give a little advice and then you revise back. You give your, uh, your uh, mm, uh, you know, you give the information, but you have to give the time to the woman to think about as well. So in three months, you will go back to your patient, you will revise and you will do again the risk and benefit. I think that's very interesting. Uh, Rosella, one of the questions, and I'll quote it verbatim from Anonymous, says, how long should the first medical visit to discuss menopausal symptoms be? Have gynecologists been adequately trained to treat with MHT in the last 20 years? You know, we are at the IMS. I think we did an effort together with all the other society. Unfortunately, as you know very well, we have data out there in the literature suggesting that we do not devote too much time to teach in our OBGYN curriculum about menopause. And I absolutely agree with you that a menopause visit should last longer because we have many aspects to address. But you know that sometimes you have to focus uh, on specific aspects, maybe during the first consultation, and then you should open the door to do a second consultation. We have now, we are in a difficult time with the COVID pandemic, we are doing in some countries more telemedicine. Maybe this will help. So sometimes not all bad things uh, are bad, you know, and maybe we have opportunity to rethink about the way we should counsel women. And in those countries in which telemedicine is there, we can devote more time uh, to our patients. So uh, we have to take uh, courses. We really need to follow uh, the meeting, uh, the, the webinar and the Congress and uh, why not the IMS uh, educational program in order to uh, train ourselves. I always uh, see a lot of doctors, they have uh, uh, white uh, air. They know a lot about oh, menopause. None. Exactly, or none, or they died, yeah, like myself, whereas a younger generation, they don't know nothing. So we really need to go on with the IMS teaching uh, about menopause, because this is relevant. Yes, indeed. Well, you're right, of course, about university teaching. There's, I think, only one university in Australia which actually has a compulsory component on the menopause. Of course, we do at Sydney, but it's pretty unusual. Um, another interesting question, which I think, Merrin, you may have seen, was the comment that in developed countries, menopause becomes a stigma. Would you? So that that's the uh, that's that side of the equation that gets to the outrage thing, doesn't it? In some ways, what do you think of that? Definitely. And uh, a bit of shameless self-promotion. I have a paper with a PhD student who is doing her, her research, uh, research on uh, communication of patients who have had hysterectomy. So they have that, that induced menopause and that has that extra layer of taboo and, and other issues surrounding it as well. Um, so there's a special um, issue called Neglected Spaces and it's in the Journal of Science Communication, which is coming out in early January. It's open access so everyone can see it. But a lot of the literature has shown that be when you have that taboo and I can see somebody else has commented on this in here as well you get Dr Google stepping in and then you have the little echo chambers on social media and then the friends of friends and I think if you hide something people people want information and they're going to go after it in any way that they can you you want to be able to help yourself you want to arm yourself with knowledge and empower yourself to 
seek the, the appropriate assistance and treatment. And I think we're seeing it in developed countries, it's in developing countries, it has uh, some cultural um, restrictions as well in certain, in certain countries. And it's, it's something that it's, it's not seen as something that should be discussed in polite company. I'm sorry, but you know, half of the population is going to experience it. And it also has implications for workforces. So if you're going through menopause and you are experiencing extreme fatigue or hot flushes or things which otherwise impact your productivity at work, you should be able to have a conversation with your employer about that uh, and and get the the requisite adjustments made you can if you if you have children you can if you're pregnant you can if you adopt you can if you're post-surgical so why not for a natural process i think it's it's time we sort of you know lifted that shroud a little bit and actually started talking about it and removing some of that shame yeah i couldn't agree more it is uh, it's it's a funny thing isn't it the menopause um affects a lot of women terribly and some women not much at all. And the sisterhood doesn't stick together at all on this one. If you don't have symptoms, you don't understand why your friends complain. Yeah, yeah. All, of this, all of this is ahead of me. I'll let Rosella answer this one. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, I, I agree 100% because uh, listen, my dear friend, I believed really that gender equality We'll, we will we really reach gender equality in, in, the, in, the, in the meantime, we will speak aloud that we are different as women because we have menopause, you know, and we acknowledge because the real is like we, with PMS. We don't say we are premenstrual syndrome because we are afraid we are discriminated because we are weaker. We are not weaker. We are just different. And if we speak aloud that the menopause is something simple and we don't hide, that this can uh, be attached with some symptoms and difficulties that maybe will last uh, for a while that we can fix with a treatment or whatever, we will really reach that gender equality. And yeah. this is what we have to achieve, <laughs> to be proud of being different. Rosella, we've had a few uh, questions from colleagues saying that the menopause itself is poorly understood in their countries. I'm suspecting that IMS might have an approach to try and help people with that through CAMS and so on. Yeah, this is a wonderful opportunity to <laughs> say that CAMS is really alive. We have a, a new president, Tommaso Simoncini, a new general secretary, Peter Sedrao. We have a, a energy now to try to uh, do educational program. Uh, they are really focused and centered on the different need because we realize that we are an international society and we really need to translate together with the help of the local society, the one that they are the most representative in the field from your country, which one, which one are the real need? Because maybe in Italy, you know, it's really easy to talk about, let's say vaginal dryness or genital urinary syndrome of menopause. Maybe in other countries, this is still a taboo. So together right now with the new CAMS program, I'm sure that we can conduct surveys, that we can understand really what is needed in terms of educational material, how to raise the awareness. We will have also a very nice uh, um, uh, program in which we will do some video appeals with all the major experts to try to discuss uh, uh, different symptoms. And this will be nice for women, for example, if they can reach these uh, social media channels. So I'm sure we will do something in terms of education that will be country specific. That's great, thank you very much. And Marin, another one of the questions was, I think, which is quite true, Rosella would agree with me, there are lots of different types of menopausal hormone therapy and sometimes women are prescribed one option and it doesn't work for them and they get quite disillusioned. So how can you teach the doctor to listen to that feedback and manage the expectations? Oh, that's a loaded question, um, particularly as I'm not necessarily involved in training doctors per se. But maybe would, you should be. 
<laughs> well, I would like to say that I think for a lot of doctors, um, you know, based on the questions that are here and the two of you, I would hope that those doctors would be in the minority. I think, you know, empathy is the cornerstone. Like you are there to help your patients get the best possible outcomes and you can't do yep. that by ignoring their needs. Um, certainly I'm sure patients will ignore your advice and not necessarily do the things that you advise, but I think it would still come back to that, that common ground. I mean, probably one way to, to talk to the doctor about it would be to have them go through that experience themselves, um, yeah. <laughs> potentially, Quite but right. I think yeah, <laughs> also patients can vote with their feet. They can choose to, to consult with somebody yeah. else who will actually put their needs first. Yeah, but the point you make is very valid. I think, I think it's important for people to understand what the patient's going through and not be dismissive of it, really. That's the big problem. Would you yeah. say, Rosella? I want to just say also that we never have to overpromise to our patient. You know, we always have no. to say, listen, <clears throat> according to the information that I collect from your medical history and uh, discussing with you all your need, expectation, understanding, etc., this is my best choice. But please remember that, you know, some women, they do not respond well to a treatment. It's absolutely normal to have some kind of side effects, or maybe you are specifically vulnerable. And we will discuss that uh, in the future. Uh, we can have the opportunity to discuss again this. Women, they understand that maybe uh, the doctor did his best, but was that was not enough, and they will come back and we will go further and maybe we will understand better what is needed or just you change sometimes. We, it's common experience that you think so much about the patient and then you select that kind of progestogen or treatment estrogen and then she responds better to another one. This is happening, I mean, so no big deal. The most important thing is really to do the therapeutic alliance, that the woman believe that you were doing the best for her according to your knowledge. And she will come back and, we, and, and you will go on. And sometimes you need time to, to know your patient, you know, and to understand really what is needed. Thank you. Um, and Rosella, one for you again. We've had a few questions about uh, breast cancer risk. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of our colleagues wrote and said, there was a recent uh, second paper by Vina Gradover et al looking at breast cancer risk with different progestogens. And would you care to comment on that? Not specifically on the paper, but the issue of the effect of different progestogens on breast cancer? This is a very important point. As you know very well, uh, we have uh, some data out there suggesting, of, as you know, I'm from Europe, and we were using a lot of natural uh, progesterone, micronized progesterone, retroprogesterone. They are different from, uh, let's say, metroprogesterone acetate that, that was used uh, in, the, uh, in the study that were published in the uh, United States or, for example, in Northern Country, uh, the uh, noretisterone acetate progesterone. So what, as far as uh, what we know, uh, in, in our um, experience, uh, uh, by using natural progesterone, we have a milder effect in terms of uh, uh, breast cancer risk. And this is in line also with a milder effect on cardiovascular risk. But you know, everything uh, depends uh, on what you want to achieve. Let's say that you need, for example, uh, to use a, a, a progestogen that has some kind of androgenic activity because you want to reinforce a, a positive effect uh, on mood, libido, maybe bone density. And so you have to play, you know, with that. And you, you, you cannot be sure that a progesterone will be better than another. We have some data out there, but we don't have a big randomized double blind study, huge study such as you gain with the WHI. What we know with the WHI, we know only with medroprogesterone acetate. 
And so you have always to individualize the treatment, in my opinion, to your patient according to the symptoms, because women, they come to see us because of the symptoms. And so you really need to fix the best treatment that we relieve the symptom and then think about what you can gain in terms of cardiovascular risk. Uh, in obese women, for example, you use transdermal estrogen and maybe you can give a try with natural progesterone because we know the natural progesterone can be better in terms of breast cancer risk, cardiovascular, et cetera. But if the woman, she does not tolerate progesterone, natural progesterone, you should switch to another without thinking too much a little difference, you know, try to improve the quality of life. And then on the long run, you will discuss again, you know, but first you should treat your patient. This is my personal opinion. Good, thank you. We've had quite a few questions also on how long you should continue MHT. I think just to reiterate what I said, we don't believe there is a mandatory stopping point. Um, I spend, unfortunately, a fair bit of my time talking to people whose family doctors have sent them to me because they've been on MHT for five years and they've been told they have to stop. And when they do, they have terrible symptoms. And as long as there's no contraindication to continuing, I would always encourage them to do so. So just look at each. I mean, it really comes down to what we've talked about today. When you're taking a history and talking to your patient, it should be a two-way thing. You need to assess what's important to her and what her concerns, her needs are, and what her risks and fears are as well, and then treat her accordingly. Don't the book sometimes isn't right. I think that's important. I think we've probably just about done our time. There are still plenty of questions that we've been unable to answer, uh, but we really have run out of time. And uh, if we can, I'll endeavor to answer those in writing for you at some time in the future. But I would like to thank both of our speakers today, Dr. Merrin McKinnon and Professor Rosella Napi for giving such wonderful talks. It was really lovely to spend the, in, our, in, in, in my case, the night with you, Rosella. And Merrin, it looks as though you're about to fall asleep. Thank you very much for your contribution. And to all of you who've tuned into this live and who will watch it on later webinars, thank you very much for joining us and good night. <laughs>